Welcome back to Theology Thursday. I feel so prepared for this. I feel so qualified to talk about this topic today because we're talking about sin. So I am eminently qualified to speak to sin because I am a sinner. Uh, glad you're here with me. Um, we're going to talk about sin, the law of God, and we're going to talk about the gospel. Can't separate those. When I talk about sin, you need to talk about the gospel. When you talk about the law, you need to talk about the gospel. So first, before we jump into sin, we're going to talk about who God is. Because um, we want to talk about why sin is so bad. And sin is so bad because God is so good. So uh, this is, if you've, if you've been with us, uh, you recognize this. This is a symbol for God, uh, the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all God, um, all separate, but the sharing the same essence as God. So when we talk about sin, which is bad, we're going to talk about God, who is good. We're going to talk about God's righteousness. Now, God has some righteous qualities in who he is. Surprise, surprise. Um, we call these his internal righteousness. Okay, internal righteousness. Now, uh, his internal righteousness uh, has two components. Now, there's, there's more things we can talk about the goodness of God, but we're going to talk about two components to God's righteousness. This is who he is, internal righteousness, positive holiness. Okay, God has positive holiness, not positive as in good. We're going to talk about his negative holiness, not negative holiness as in bad, but stick with me here. So God has inside of himself, internal righteousness that is positive holiness. Now, positive holiness is the essential goodness of God. Okay? The essential goodness of God and his goodness towards his creatures. Aren't you glad he has positive holiness? He is good towards you. That's who he is in his essence. So in his nature... He is good toward his creation. And God also has negative holiness. Now, where this one was awesome, makes me feel great about myself, this one gives me a bit of fear and trembling. Because negative holiness says God's, it is God's righteousness and his goodness that keeps him eternally separated from sin. Do you get that? Do you get why that gives me a little bit of fear and trembling? Because I'm a sinner. And in God's nature, in His internal righteousness and goodness, He is so holy that He is going to be separated from sinfulness eternally. Wow. Now, where do we get this? We get this, uh, Habakkuk 1.13 is a great example of this. You, God, who are who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot even look at wrong. Okay, that's how holy God is. That's how holy He is. And so this holiness, positive and negative, we see this in Isaiah when the, the creatures are flying around the throne room of God. What are they saying? God is love. He is love. God is just. He is just. God is good. He is good. He's powerful. He's all these things. But what do they sing about? Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled, is full of His glory. Now there's one more internal aspect of God we want to talk about when we talk about sin. Positive holiness, negative holiness, internal righteousness, God is just. God is just. There is an absolute necessity for divine justice. There is an absolute necessity for God to act justly and be just. That means when we think about God, we are thinking about justice. Just as when we think about God, we are thinking about love. When we think about God, we're thinking about justice. God and justice go together. There's no separating them. God will never act in an unjust way. God will always seek ultimate justice. That's just who he is. That's his nature. 
It'd be like, it'd be like saying uh, being unmarried is necessary to be a bachelor. You see how those things go hand in hand? Have you ever met a married bachelor? No, it doesn't make sense. It's nonsense in the same way to, to say God is unjust is nonsense. It just couldn't happen. He is by necessity in who he is. He is just. Now, so he's got, in, he's got internal justice, internal righteousness. He also displays external righteousness. Okay, so this internal righteousness is manifest into external righteousness through what? How does he show us righteousness? How does he teach us righteousness? His external righteousness is made manifest, is on display in the law. In the law. Okay? So, internal righteousness, external righteousness of God in the law for his creation. Okay? And his law is going to reflect his nature and his goodness and his holiness uh, so we can trust it. We can trust the law. The law is good. The law is a good thing. Now, and more fear and trembling. Are you ready? Now, if we were to summarize what God requires of his creation and his creatures, his moral creatures, humanity, what does he require of human beings? We could summarize the law. What is God trying to get from us? Well, God's law God's requirement for us is perfection. Can you see why? I mean, we talked about the holy nature of God and justice and goodness. I mean, he can't he he can't stand for evil at all. He's so good. And that makes us fear and tremble a bit, and it should because we're sinners. Um, and, And we might have a temptation to say, perfection, wow, God, well, that's just too much. No, He's so good. And isn't that, a, isn't that a praiseworthy thing for God? That He is so good that He will never let evil go on unpunished forever. That He will always bring justice. Ultimately, He will bring justice and He will bring righteousness. That's a praiseworthy thing. But the other side of that coin is God requires perfection. Now, you don't need to take my word for anything. This is, this is why we, we see this. Leviticus 11.44 says this, For I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am holy. Be holy as He is holy. 1 Peter 1.16 says the same thing. Talking about this Leviticus verse, Peter says, You shall be holy, for I am holy. God requires perfection, and He should, and that's good. James 2.10 summarizes the perfection God requires like this. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of it all. That's perfection. Where does that leave me for self-righteousness? Where does that leave me? Do I, do I, am I great? How could I possibly think that I'm a good person worthy of your admiration or worthy of heaven on my own. How could I possibly believe that if James says one slip up under the law, one sin means I'm guilty of all the law. Wow. Okay. So that's God's requirement. That's God's uh, that the, the law of God, his external righteousness is displayed, made manifest in his law. His requirement is perfection. And now we're going to talk about the law of God. And the law of God talks about righteousness, is about righteousness. It's, it's how we are to behave. How are we to behave in a righteous way, reflecting the righteousness of God? And there are two parts that we're going to talk about when it comes to this kind of righteousness. Two parts when it comes to the law. Okay? There is, the le- there is legislative righteousness. Legislative righteousness. Okay, that's part of the law. Legislative. Can you imagine what that's about when it comes to the law? Well, like our legislature, right? Congress and the Senate, what do they do? 
They write laws. They create laws. And so what do you think the legislative part of God's law is all about? Well, the legislative part is the declaration of these standards. It is, it is giving the law, it is the declaration of the law before any action takes place under the law. Are you with me? It is when the law is written. Okay? So God gives us this law before any action is taken. That's legislative. And God's legislative law is displayed in two ways. There are two types of ways that God shows us this law before any action can take place. There's two types of legislative righteousness seen in God's law. Natural law written on our hearts. So Scripture tells us, Scripture tells us that the law of God can be seen and believed and felt in all of our hearts. It's written on our heart. We get that in Romans chapter 1. It says this, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For... So God's wrath is being displayed against all unrighteousness because He is so holy. Any breaking of the law, His his wrath is coming because what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, has been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in things that he has made so we can see the stars and understand who God is. And in our hearts, we can perceive, we can know who he is. He says it this way in Romans 2, or when Gentiles who do not have the law, like Scripture, who do not have the law written in Scripture, when they do by nature what the law requires, they are the law to themselves even though they do not have the law in Scripture. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts. Written on their hearts. So the law of God, the legislative righteousness is displayed in nature and in our hearts. But that's not the only place it is. That's not the only place is. Where else can we see the law of God displayed, displayed out? Where else can we see the legislative righteousness of God displayed out to us? John 1.17, For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So Moses, I'm going to use, I'll, I'll draw him. I'll draw him up here. Look, got a little beard all around, a staff. There's Moses. Moses gave us the legislative law. Okay, that means God gave us special revelation through men like Moses who wrote Scripture, and in that Scripture, God has revealed what He requires in His law. And we see Moses giving us three types of legislative laws. Do you know what these are? He gives us the civil law, the ceremonial law, and the moral law. Okay, The law of Moses, the Old Testament law, can be broken up into civil, ceremonial, or moral. This is God laying out righteousness. This is what righteousness is. This is my law. He has prescribed for us. The civil law is for the nation of Israel. How do you govern what, uh, how, do you, how do you behave amongst your neighbors? What do you do when someone breaks the law? This is uh, found in the Old Testament. This is how, how that nation of Israel is to be uh, led and ruled. How do you keep a rule of law in the nation of Israel that's God's people? The civil law written by Moses. You also have the ceremonial law. This is, how do you relate to God? How do, you, how do things work in the temple? How do things work with the sacrificial system? What do you do? Ritually clean yourself in the, for, for temple worship. How do you do all those things? Where do you get that? That's the law of God. 
written to the people of Israel to, so that they can hear the legislative law, see what they, God requires of them, and they can act. Now, do you, ever, do you ever have people ask you, well, you Christians are so inconsistent. Uh, the scripture says you shouldn't eat shellfish. I saw you chowing down on, on shrimp the other day at, at the restaurant. Well, you're so, the Bible says you shouldn't be doing that. Well, that's a person who doesn't understand that, yes, this was in the law of God, but the law of God is not just a book about what you have to do and what you don't do. There's, there's context to who God sent this to. So not eating shellfish is, is here, okay? God also gives us through Moses the moral law. This is the one that we still abide by today. The moral law summarized in what? Ten Commandments. In Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments continually have authority over our lives. This is for Israel. Okay? We don't need to require America to run their government in the way Israel did. Are there good principles there? Sure. But do we have to go one-to-one -one ratio? No, you don't do that anymore. Ceremonial law. Do we have to do all this? Do we need to ritually clean ourselves in the same way when we come to church? No. Why not? Well, for a few reasons, but the primary one, Jesus has come. There's a new way to interact with God, and that's through Jesus. We no longer need the temple. Jesus is our new temple. We no longer need to sacrifice animals because Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice. And so those laws were good, but Jesus is better. Jesus is better. But the moral laws are still in place. And Jesus says it this way in Matthew 5, 17. He says, do not think I have come to abolish the law. Okay, Jesus doesn't show up to kick all of this stuff out. He said, I didn't come to abolish the law. I've come to fulfill the law. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, not a dot over the T or a dot over the I will pass from the law until it is all accomplished. And so we have legislative law. This is how we know the law of God. This is how God has, has revealed His external righteousness and the law requiring perfection. And this is how we know it, through our heart, through nature, and through Moses. Now, we've got, what, what's another branch of our government? You've got legislative righteousness. You also have what? That's before an act is done. Now we have judicial Righteousness. What do you think that means? That is righteousness that comes into play after an act is performed. So when somebody acts under the law, the judicial righteousness is about, did they do something good or did they do something bad? Did they do something that deserves reward? That's distributive. Distributive justice is when somebody does something good, I give them, I distribute something to them. They're obedient. Or, does it need to be punitive? What does that mean? So if this is good, yay. When my, girls, when my girl gets an A plus on her math homework, I give her a treat. I give her a sticker. I give her something special. That is distributive justice. When my little girl refuses to do her math, and throws, instead throws her spaghetti all over daddy. That hasn't happened, by the way. Um, punitive justice is what will happen when someone breaks part of the law. When someone breaks part of the law. So, do you see how this all works out? So here's the law. Internal righteousness, external righteousness displayed in the law, requiring perfection. This is how we know this is how we know what the law of God is. We see it play out. And then this is, what, this is how uh, the law is to be taken after an act is done for good, distributive, or bad, punitive. Now that is, so that, that's the law of God right there. That's, that, that's it spelled out. How, what, what does it look like? Is it, is it a good thing? Well, yeah, Scripture says that the law of God is perfect. Okay, just because we're not doing sacrifices anymore doesn't mean the law of God is not perfect. Psalm 19.7 says, The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. 
The law is majestic. That means it is the highest law. The law of God is kingly. Give it a crown and a robe. James 2.8 It is unchanging. Well, I know God says murder is wrong. We see murder being wrong over here, but maybe He's going to change His mind. He's not going to change His mind. There are laws written to a particular people that have come and gone, but no law will ever change. God will not change His mind about what's good and what's bad. What's good and what's bad might be different for different people. You see what I mean? Um, a, law, a law pertaining to women doesn't pertain to me, just as a law pertaining to the nation of Israel doesn't pertain to the, law, uh, to, to the nation of America. But the law of God, God's not going to change His mind on what's good and what's righteous and what's not. Do you follow me? Hope you, hope you follow me. hope that was clear. Uh, the law of God is pure. Okay? All these things are true of the law of God. It is pure. And as we talked about, Christ has not abolished the law. That's what, he, that's what he says. He does not abolish the law. In fact, the law of God is useful. Jesus tells the parable about the rich man and Lazarus. Both of whom die at the same time. Lazarus goes uh, to heaven. Um, uh, the rich man goes to hell. The rich man sees Abraham. And he calls out to Abraham, Father Abraham. He says, Father Abraham, go warn my brothers. This place is terrible. Go warn them. Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. They have the law. They don't need me to go talk to them. They've got the law. They've got everything they need. The law of God is still profitable. It can bring people to the knowledge of their desperate need for salvation. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. Romans 3.31 even says that the faith of believers upholds the law. He says, do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. So when we come to Christ and we have faith, what are we going to do with this law that pertains to us? We're going to uphold it. We're going to want to obey these things. We're going to want to obey these things that pertain to us. And so, here's the law. We've seen it spelled out, probably too spelled out. And so now the question is, how does little old me stack up to this? Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We see the glory of God. I am under the law. And I've sinned. Now, what does, what does sin mean? Well, the Bible has a lot of terms for sin. It can mean bent, crooked, corrupt. It can mean to fall, to stumble. So I'm walking under the law, and when I sin, I stumble and I fall. It can mean to rebel. Here's the law given by my king, and when I sin, I rebel against that law. It can mean, a term it can just mean lawless. It can mean sometimes the Old Testament connects sin with the consequences of sin and uses a term like destruction. You, that'd be a good thing for us to start doing maybe. When we talk about our sin, we don't say, well, I sinned yesterday. Say, man, I, I destroyed yesterday. Ooh, ruin. Ruin is another good one. But what they use most of all is miss the mark. Old Testament and New Testament. Miss the mark. What does that mean? It's like, a, it's like an archer shooting for this target to be like God, to be perfect, to like God. And I shoot for that target. When I miss, I sin. I'm shooting for a target. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that's not okay. It's bad news. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. To be under the law, and we're all under the law, in our hearts, if we don't know, if we don't have the Bible, it's in our hearts and in nature we can see these things. 
And for us Christians, it's spelled out in our scriptures. We know what the law of God requires. The wages of breaking, the wages of missing that mark in the law of God is death. Wages of sin is death. Jesus says it this way. Do not be afraid of those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. So what's the punitive justice for being a sinful person? What's the punitive, ultimate punitive justice for me in my sinfulness? Hell. That's the punitive justice. That's the punitive justice. Now, how do I get out of this? How do I get out from under the wrath of God? Is that what you're asking? That's what I'm asking. Now, when we come over here and we ask that, man, I've broken the law. I deserve hell. Maybe I can earn forgiveness. Is that how it works with with the law? There's this idea. There's this idea of supererogatory acts. I'm not going to write that down, so I'm not sure I'd be able to spell it even if I had it in front of me. Supererogatory acts. Supererogatory acts are, are acts done under the law that goes above and beyond. Okay, this is basically self-righteousness, trying our best to say, I've, no, I've broken the law, but if I do enough good things, I'll deserve distributive justice, and I can avoid hell, and I can go and be with God. Maybe if I, this is how ridiculous that is, maybe if I have a, get a ticket for speeding through a red light, maybe I could take uh, the judge pictures of all the times that I stopped at a red light. Or all the times I went through a green light. And maybe that will earn from me, no punitive, but maybe that will earn from me heaven. Or maybe it's like, it's like a murderer saying, yeah, I killed that one guy, but look at all the people in town that I let live. Isn't that good enough? Or it's karma. It's saying, I'm going to do enough good things to outweigh my bad things. Is that how the law works? No. No. You break one law, you broke them all. You murder one person, it doesn't matter how many flowers you bought your wife. You're a lawbreaker. And when we're under the law of God from a holy God who the law requires perfection, in no way your supererogatory acts, there's no way your self-righteousness, there's no way your good can outweigh your bad. Because God is just And he's not going to say, boy, you smiled at that person at the bank. That was really nice. I'm going to take away all your sins. That that paid for all your sins. That's not how it works. He wouldn't be a good God if that's how it worked. So how in the world can we be saved? There's law. And there's gospel. It'll make me cry. Boy, I'm so thankful for this. Look how messy that is over there. There's gospel. The law was given, requiring perfection, telling every human being who ever lived what he required. And God is true to his word. When we break it, we have judicial righteousness that brings punitive justice. That's what the law requires. But Romans 3.21 says this, But now, the righteousness of God has been made manifest apart from the law. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. How awesome is that? So now, A righteousness from the righteous God has been manifest, has been external, apart from the law. And that is the gospel. And that is righteousness displayed by faith in Jesus Christ. 
And so God, in His grace, a free gift, this gospel means a free gift of good, the good news that there's now a righteousness that's apart from the law. Forgiveness apart from the works of the law. And that is through faith in Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ has come to satisfy the law. Jesus Christ has come to be our substitute for distributive justice and punitive justice. Because on the cross, in Jesus' life, was total obedience to God. Which means he has earned, the only person who ever walked the earth, to earn distributive justice for his good works. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 1 Corinthians 1.30 says this, And because of him you are in Christ, who became to us wisdom from God righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Christ has become for us righteousness. And so the distributive justice that is earned by Christ through His obedience has been given to those who have faith in Him. Isn't that awesome? It's called imputed righteousness. The righteousness of Christ is credited to your bank account. You go, that's not fair. That's not how the world really works. Imputed stuff, I mean, you didn't earn that. Well, I guarantee if you own a vehicle, you're involved in imputed righteousness. When you own a vehicle and you have car insurance, there is imputed negligence. So that means if... I have a car, and I let you drive my car. You get behind the wheel, you crash it. Guess who gets in trouble for that? Me. Well, you did it. Well, your bad driving has been imputed to me. In a very similar way, but in the opposite way. Christ's good driving has been imputed for me through my faith in Him. And so what does this earn me? What is the distributive justice? What is given for this obedience? Scripture says that he will, he will lavish us with grace upon grace. What is given to us? A eternal home with God. Eternal joy never ending. That God will receive glory after glory when He makes us so satisfied in Him. Eternal satisfaction. All these things are earned for us, not because of our action but because of the obedience of Christ. And Christ has satisfied punitive justice on the cross. Atonement. So Christ has turned away the punitive justice of God by taking our sins. Another imputed statement, right? Taking our sins upon Himself. And that He paid the penalty for all who trust in Him. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon Him was the punishment that brought us peace. And by His wounds we are healed. The Lord has laid on Him the sins of us all. Isaiah 53, 5-6 This whole thing that leads to hell has been laid on Jesus And it has been satisfied. And now, a righteousness apart from the law is available to you and to me. And God's graciousness doesn't come through supererogatory acts, doesn't come for trying to obey the law better and better, doesn't come through that, it's impossible. What does it come through? The generous grace of God, the free gift that is given to us through Jesus. And we accept this through faith. What a blessing. What a blessing. We love you. Glad you spent time with me today. I hope maybe this clarified some things. What I hope it it did, above all, is it showed that you and I, over here, we can't do it. 
But God in His great love for us and His great mercy sent Jesus who is able to accomplish everything. He is great. We love you. Praise His name. I'll see you next time.